total and net ionic equations. What you need to know before you start double displacement reactions and predict the precipitation of compounds are the solubility rules. These are the simple solubility rules that can be used. Most of the sols of group 1 metals like sodium, potassium and ammonium are always soluble in water. Sols of nitrates, chlorates, perchlorates and acetates are also soluble in water. However, there are some exceptions. Most of the chlorides, bromides and iodides are soluble, but if it's a silver chloride, lead chloride or mercury 1 chloride, then the compound is insoluble in water. Compounds containing fluoride are usually soluble. If it's not, magnesium fluoride, calcium fluoride, barium fluoride, strontium fluoride and lead fluoride. Salts of sulfate that are insoluble are calcium sulfate, barium sulfate, strontium sulfate and lead sulfate. You will notice that calcium, barium and strontium belong to group 2. So it's easy to remember that. Now looking at it from a different perspective, most of the salts of carbonates, phosphates, oxalates and chromates, if they have a cation that's coming from group 1 or ammonium ions, then the compound will be soluble. Most sulfides are insoluble, again with the exception of ammonium sulfide, potassium sulfide and sodium sulfide. Most metal hydroxide and oxides are insoluble in water, with of course the exception of group 1 metals and ammonium ions. Let's define the term soluble. When you say something is soluble in water, this is what you will mean. Let's take ammonium chloride. It's a white crystalline solid and if you put it in water, it disappears. When it disappears, what we say is it has dissolved in water. So the process is called dissociation. We physically see that the solid disappears, which is because it changes into ammonium ions and chloride ions. And we represent it by putting subscripts like AQ, which means that it has been soluble in water or is an aqueous solution right now. When we say a substance is insoluble, we're talking about precipitates. Here we are considering silver chloride. If you refer to the solubility rules, silver chloride has got low solubility or it's insoluble in water. So if you add silver chloride to water, it's not going to dissolve. It will remain an insoluble substance or a precipitate is formed. Now here is an example for you for the reaction between sodium chloride and silver nitrate. If you apply the rules of solubility, sodium belongs to group 1, therefore sodium chloride should be soluble in water. And you know that if you put table salt in water, it dissolves. Similarly, the second compound is silver nitrate. Silver nitrate is a nitrate and all nitrates are soluble in water. Therefore, we have two aqueous solutions or two beakers filled with sodium chloride and silver nitrate. If you mix the two together, and if there is a chemical reaction taking place, it obviously will show the formation of a precipitate. The equation tells you that the precipitate formed will be silver chloride because silver chloride has got a low solubility. Let's see what happens now. We can dissociate the sodium chloride and silver nitrate when you put it in water. And this is how you will write the equation where all this material that are present in water are soluble. So the sodium chloride changes into Na plus and Cl minus. Silver nitrate changes into Ag positive and NO3 minus. Sodium nitrate again is soluble in water because it's sodium and nitrate changes into Na plus and NO3 minus. But silver chloride has low solubility. Therefore, it will remain as a solid or it will be a precipitate. If you cancel out the common terms or cross out the common terms on both sides, what remains would be Ag positive plus Cl minus aqueous gives you silver chloride. 
The second equation is called total ionic equation. And the third equation is called net ionic equation. Those crossed out ions are called spectator ions because they do not form a precipitate. This is how you write total ionic equations and net ionic equations. That's it for now.